How's everyone doing tonight? This is Chopping It Up Hardcore with Hal Capone, discussion number 88. Tonight, my special guest is Anthony Bereshi from the Hall of Fame iconic hardcore band, Ten Yard Fight. He was also in a band called Impact that changed their name to Stand and Fight from California. Um, he's the creator of the docuseries Don't Stand in Line. Um, he has his own podcast, The Kodak Projects, um, done documentaries with Ann McFarlane, um, the Slapshot documentary, a Red Sox documentary. Um, yeah, it's just super pumped to talk to him. Can't wait to talk about the Boston scene. I grew up in the Boston scene, so saw a 10-yard fight like numerous times. Just always a good, great time. So super pumped to talk to Anthony. He should be joining at any minute. Hope everybody's good. Hope everybody's well. Hot one this week. It's going to be pretty brutal next week, I guess. But uh, I'd rather have this than snow, so... But he should be jumping on any second. Like I said, I can't wait to talk to him. I mean, he worked for 411, um, put out the, you know, worked on the CK2, uh, the CKY2K videos. Um, just had his hand in everything that's super interesting. So, yeah, I just can't wait. Hopefully there'll be no uh, technical difficulties. Sometimes IG Live has its own uh, mind of its own, you know, so. But we'll make it work, promise. Like I said, Ten Year Fight is one of my favorite bands of all time crazy that they played the 2018 uh, This Is Hardcore Fest. Um, great video. I wish I was there. Anthony should be jumping on any second. Just waiting on him. Hopefully Bridge Nine puts out some more shirts. Uh, all their all their ten yard fight shirts are sold out now. I was a little late on that game, so I need my old uh, ten yard fight shirt. You know. If he doesn't jump on in a few minutes, I'll I'll, uh, I'll jump off and jump back on again. And see see uh, if he's having problems or whatever. Should be good to go though. There we go. Anthony, I'm sending you an invite right now. There we go. Anthony, hey, you? how's it going? Sorry, I was having some technical issues. Uh no problem. No problem at all. Uh, I want to thank you so much for taking time out to do this. You're a family man like me, so, you know, I have young kids, and I know you have kids, and so I, I appreciate you taking time out to, to talk about hardcore and whatever yeah. going yeah, on. Yeah, no problem. You see me okay? Is it yep. kind of weird? All right. All right, cool. Perfect, perfect. Um, usually when I start out these talks, I usually ask, um, where were you brought up? I know you you were brought up in Massachusetts, but... It's kind of like a two-part question. Where were you brought up, and what were you listening to for music before you kind of found hardcore? Uh, I was brought up in North Andover, Mass. Um, what was I listening to? The Cure, New Order, kind of stuff like that. And then, I don't know, Beastie Boys also. like Kind of a, a wide range of stuff. It's never really in a classic rock at that point, like a lot of my friends were, but more sort of like alternative and some like early – Hip hop stuff, Run DMC, uh, a little ACDC, like that. I remember, like, I think the first two pieces of music I bought, I think I was in like sixth grade. I think I got the Who Made Who soundtrack and um, Run DMC. Uh, 
what was the name of it? Not Tougher Than Leather. The other one with uh, oh, the Aerosmith uh, song. I should uh, know this. I, it, yeah, it doesn't really matter, I guess. But I, I, uh, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank. I should really know that. But. Yeah, it's a, uh, is it something in hell? Is that what it's called? It's, Raising uh, Hell. Raising Raise, Hell. Raising Hell, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so with the with the classic rock, did that stuff kind of turn you off because of uh, like for me, my mom was um, kind of like a hippie and was brought up in the drug culture and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and there was like a household. So when I was younger, I rebelled against like like I, I kind of put that as kind of like, you know, that kind of music. So I kind of rebelled against that. And I started when I was real young. I turned 50 just a few months ago. I started oh, wow. I, I started listening. I'm right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you're uh, 48, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I started listening to, like, disco, and then that turned into, like you said, alternative stuff. Like, yeah. I was listening to the police and Clash and stuff like that, and then that turned into, like, you know, heavy metal and then thrash metal and then hardcore came into it. Right. Yeah, I mean, I guess it was more of the, um, what's the word for it? More of, like, the, uh, you know, it sounds bad to say now but like the, the, the people who were into it like i had cousins that were into it and like there was kids in high school that were into it they were usually like the kids with the longer hair and the the denim jackets that reeked with cigarettes and like it just the whole thing like not even the music because i didn't even probably even give it a chance but like everything that surrounded the music just seemed like something i didn't really want to be part of yeah yeah I, I agree totally now did you play sports when you were growing up um uh, not really. Um, just like, you know, uh, touch football or whatever on like in elementary school, I could try playing baseball a little. I was terrible at it. Um, yeah, not really. I, I was always just more into like the individual things. Like I'm just guess I'm maybe just not a good team player. Uh, I like, you know, I was just always into BMX skateboarding and like anything you could do, uh, by yourself, I guess, like, you know, I was always kind of introverted. So, you know, I was just happy on my own, you know, for the most part. Whereas, you know, like this, the, honestly, the pandemic was like no big deal. For me. Yeah, so yeah. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm so cool is how I operate anyway. Yeah, same for me, <laughs> definitely. Now, now, being that you like BMX and skateboarding, did that kind of transition you into listening to hardcore? Did you see kids that were listening to that punk and then you kind of... Yeah. What's that? Yeah, definitely. Um, the, like two of the kids that I rode bikes and skated with all the time, def I guess, got me into it. Um, took a while because at first I really didn't understand it. Like I couldn't, you know, I couldn't make out the words. So I didn't, the message wasn't coming through to me. I just sounded like a bunch of noise to me because I was used to, I mean, I'm used to listening to New Order, <laughs> yeah. The Cure at this point. So it was like kind of different. Um, but then, I mean, the thing that really like, made me take attention is um i was riding in the back of my friend mike's car and i didn't really even understand straight edge at the point like like at that point but like i i just i knew i didn't want to have anything to with drinking or drugs and i think it was probably i don't know like early high school maybe a freshman but my friend could drive and like i just know like that was the point where everyone was kind of starting to get into that kind of stuff and experimenting or even like an eighth grader in my like, you know, at that point. But, like, I just know that, like, I didn't want anything to do with it. And um, the – I was riding in the back of the car, and he's playing a tape, and it was, like, a just a mixed tape, and most of it's just going all right over my head, not even understanding it. It just sounded like noise. And then uh, there's the slap shot chant comes on. And, like, I could understand what was being said. Yeah. And, you know, take it for what it is. Anyone who knows that knows it's – no yeah you know, it's it's pretty you know it's straightforward but it, it's i think it was tongue in cheek but man it was it's pretty like it's pretty shitty if you take it literally really to be honest with you but like at that point in my life being just so um like when you don't want to do those things and everyone around you is doing them mm. like i'm sure you, most people listening to this can relate to this like you kind of get angry and like take it the opposite direction and you're yeah. Like, well, fuck you. You know, like you, that yeah. kind of attitude. Um, so I could understand what's being said. I'm like, well, maybe I should give this a listen. So I, I start borrow some records with you know lyric sheets, like 
remember like like listen like when I the first time I like read the minor threat layers I was like holy shit this is like out of my being you know what I mean it's exactly the way I feel and you know obviously like grilled biscuits and today and all that kind of stuff so from there it was just like the music I guess just sort of grew on me um, it was really the the message the lyrics and everything that that made it stick you know yeah and and <laughs> being from North Andover in the Merrimack Valley hardcore area um, back then was like thriving because I, I lived in Haverhill for a long time and, and then I moved to New Hampshire, but um, the bands that were going on, you know, during the, the time the 10 yard fight started like cave in and pie ball oh, yeah. and um, I mean, Barrett and yeah. all kinds of, bands. I mean, it was a great scene. Um, yeah. I'd... Sorry. I was going to say, like, I mean, just, so I'm from North Andover, which is technically, it's a different town than from Andover. Mm. But, um, I mean, Andover had uh, Piebald, Converge, Converge. Um, Caven. I think, well, I think Caven's really from Methuen. But the Merrimack Valley in general, like, yeah, like you said, all these bit and a lot of them are still playing. And then, like, way bigger than Ten Year Fright ever, ever got, you know. And uh, it's, it's crazy. Like, you never would have thought. Because you start off, even way before Ten Year Fight, I'd go to, sh they had shows, um, this place called the Red Barn in my town. And it was yeah. just like, I started going there and they weren't even hardcore shows. They were just like, I don't even know how to describe it. Just like Nirvana cover bands. And like, you know, I wasn't, you'd go and it's not like I even knew better because I wasn't really even into hardcore. You just kind of go because it was somewhere to go. It was a little cooler than a school dance, mm. but not the movies or the mall. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, you, you know, you'd end up just kind of doing these weird, like, it's not like anyone you knew how to dance. You're just kind of like bumping into each other and your flannel and just like, you know, <laughs> pogoing and like that kind of stuff. And, um, but then you like every once in a while, like one of those, you know, those bands started playing and then there'd be like a real actual hardcore show, mm. um, shows in VFW halls and all, you know, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, it was crazy. Like, like to look back on it, what it became is kind of crazy. Yeah, Red Barn, I, I saw, I think I, I went there maybe three or four times. Um, and the, the first 10-yard fight show I was yeah. at. Um, oh, cool. I came a little late, so I missed the opening band. But, I like, that show was eye-opener for me seeing you guys. Um, and then on top of that, I saw 10-yard fight a bunch of other times, like um, at yeah. the Rat in the Space and uh, the American Legion show with Slapshot down in I was going to say, yeah, like, I mean, that's right down the road. Um I drive by that place all the time. It's it's crazy. Like you know, I'll point it out to my kids and be like, you know, one time, you know, back in my day, we tore that place to ground. <laughs> like, you know, those old man stories. But yeah, that was a crazy show. That was a crazy. Um, yeah, I mean, they weren't allowed to have shows for years after that. I think the next show was that last in my eyes show. Yeah, yeah. It, um, it literally that show was insane. One of the yeah. best stories I've had there. At, like. <clears throat> Because, that, like you said, they didn't have many shows after that had happened. They had a few shows before, but after that, it was like they, they barely. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was like, I mean, that was kind of the trick back then. You probably know, like, you would, most of those places, you'd get a show, like, once every couple of years. Because you have to sort of lie to the, to the people who owned it or ran the place. And, um, go, oh, we're just having, like, a party or a dance or something. And then, like. You know, sometimes they get shut down halfway into it. I mean, we definitely played some, a show, I think it was in Andover. It was like a VFW hall, mm. like early in the tenure fight where it was like, they were shutting it down. And we, I don't know what happened. We played, but it was like, I don't think we were supposed to. Like, I think they were trying to kick people out. and We just started playing. I don't know. It wasn't like, it wasn't like the, the, uh, the, uh, fucking like last rites thing but like it was like it, it, like in my mind it felt like that yeah yeah i saw you guys also at um the safe and sound up in rochester new hampshire oh yeah yeah, yeah. with uh strike three had played uh caleb's like first band that he okay from cave in that uh that was a great show too yeah that was a that was a fun place we i think we only played there maybe three times but like that was one of those places just I remember a lot about playing there. It was, it was a good time. Um, I think we might've played there with Bane once. 
I definitely saw Bane and Reach the Sky there. Um, yeah. Yeah. That was a good place. Yeah, it was crazy that that place pulled, like, good hardcore bands from back then. Because, I mean, Hatebreed played up there. And, um, yeah. I mean, Trial came and played there. Yeah. Like, the bands that just came from all over touring ended up playing in Rochester, New Hampshire. Go figure. Like, a little yeah. time had in a in a small place. But it was always packed, too. There was always kids there. Yeah, you know, it was a good like local scene. It, it was, yeah, there were definitely um, just all, like just a lot of like locals that would would always come out and support. Didn't matter who was playing. So yeah, yeah, it was a good place. I wanted to ask how Ten Yard Fight got started and what how was the football, um, you know, brought into it for you know what I mean to. Yeah, I mean, I could let's see. I'll try to make it short. The so our original guard, the guitar player, Anthony Papillardo, John LaCroix, who, I mean, he's, you know, been, was in it the whole time, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and this, so they, were, they weren't going to start a band. And um, actually, there was a guy named Al DeFusco who was supposed to sing. And it was just like a total, like, this was like a couple years before we got together and did it. Mm -hmm. And... It just they had like one practice, and the whole thing was like it was just a total tongue and cheek, tongue and cheek, just kind of joke, like pretty much like it was when we started. Um, it didn't, I don't know, it didn't pan out for whatever reason. Um, and then a couple of years later, I was living with John and Anthony in Boston, and uh, you know, I just secretly always wanted to sing for a band, like that was like my, my, you know, I wanted to be choke, you know, so yeah. that was that was my my thing, um, and. I don't know. One night, like I was hanging out with Lacroix, and and I think I was like, "Dude, we just have to do it." And I was just like, "Egging," and he was like, "Okay." And like, as soon as he kind of bit a little, I just kept pushing. And I know, we, and we sat down and designed like a, some like stupid little stickers. I probably should have pulled some of those out. I have them around here somewhere. Just yeah. like we and um, and then Anthony come home and we got them like all riled up, and so like Lacroix printed these things out. We went down to Kinko's and made stickers. It was just it, like me and Anthony skated all over Boston, just putting these stupid these stickers up, and then like, th then like I guess at that point we we're like, well, I guess we have to do it now because we we like we started advertising it or whatever. Um, little did we know we were just like, because this was like, it wasn't pre-internet, but it was real early internet, like yeah. at least for like that your average normal person. So like, there was. Like, without even knowing it, we were sort of, like, making this kind of folklore. Like, there was rumors about us that we were, like, these big, crazy jocks that just went around beating people up that weren't straight edge. You know, not at all the case. So, like, we we ended up getting um, to play drums, who had he had played bass and battery. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Chris Patterson, who was in a band called Nevertheless. And we just started, like, you know, we just started playing, I guess, and... Um, I remember I went away for a weekend after we did the whole, the stickers and John sat down and like the first song he, he wrote was first and 10. He just started, like, he just came up with the bass line. Yeah. And I guess, and I guess Anthony was like, heard him. He was like, dude, that's pretty good. And they just started like, if he hadn't come up with that, who knows? We probably wouldn't have done anything. But yeah. like, that sort of got the momentum going. And I, and I had gone away for the weekend. Cause I used to just like, I was living in Boston, but I'd go home because my girlfriend lived in Andover and I would like I had a, like a pizza delivery job and it was just like this so like I went I went away and I came back and they had like two songs and they had they had written uh, lyrics like I didn't actually write the lyrics to first and ten unfortunately um and I think and there was one other song maybe pit of equality I don't think I wrote those either um and um they had those and they had lyrics and I was like oh my god this you know this is ridiculous and then like a couple of weeks later we got a practice together and we had pretty much all the demo songs i think at the first practice like yeah. and then it was a couple of weeks of just like hammering away and brian mcturnan lived with ben and they had it and there was a studio he had salad days you know i you must he recorded a bunch of stuff um yeah. still doing it i mean sings you know singer for uh battery and be well mm -hmm. so i think people know who he is yeah, it was just like, we just all happened to be hanging out together. Like, that's, you know, I don't know. So we just got together and did it. And like I said, it was like, it was a it was a joke, but it wasn't a joke. It was like, we were really, we were serious about it. 
But I think the the fact that we brought the football theme in gave us like a little something to hide behind, I guess. You know, it yeah. was like, oh, I can say this shit without like, like, to in a way, it was kind of a cop out. Like now, that, and I never even thought about this till now. Like it was, you know, it's kind of a cop out because like I didn't actually have to stand up there and say it in like clear, plain English. Like I was using these like football metaphors, you know. Yeah. Um, and then as soon as people like caught on to it, it was like, oh yeah, of course that's what it is. That's what I mean. Like you know, it was a little easier, but you know. But you think that that football, um, you know, subject kind of caught people with it because it was something different. You know what I mean at the time. Yeah. I it gave it a, a hook, a gimmick, whatever you want to call it. it. Like, I think we were just trying to, like, it was, we wanted to do, like, a serious, like, there weren't many straight edge bands at the time. Like, Slapshot was around, but it was, like, not really around, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, and um, straight edge wasn't really cool at the point, at that point. At least, like, straightforward kind of youth crew straight edge. Like, mm. Earth Crisis was around. But that was a whole different thing, really. Yeah. Like, so we want to do like a, you know, you know, Youth Today, Grill Biscuits, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, slap shot. Like, it, it was kind of like a combination of all those things. And um, the football thing gave it a like a hook and the gimmick and whatever you want to call it, but it made it fun. So we, the one of the biggest things other than the straight edge thing was just making it fun. Because mm -hmm. at that point, so many bands were bit more now but back then it was like everything was so serious and like it was like overly pc like 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 super kind of like emo like sweater vests and like you know the you know the beads and like like there's time and place for everything but it was like it just got to this point where it was like I'm getting tired of it i want to like we just wanted to bring it back a couple years like you know which I say that now, it's like, oh my God, like if I relate it to like anything that ha happened in the last four years politically, it's yeah. like, oh my God, hopefully we weren't, we weren't <laughs> like that, the hardcore version of that. But um, yeah, without getting too too into that, but I, I mean, mean, it was almost like a rebirth of the old school, like straight edge hardcore though. At right. That, it was like what, 94, 95. And it, it like you said, it was kind of getting not stale, but there wasn't a lot of bands like that between when you were talking about Gorilla Biscuits, Youth of Today, like Bold, Judge, like those bands were kind of, you know, they were gone. Yeah. Yeah, they were done and nothing was coming out by any new band. So you guys almost made a rebirth of that style of hardcore, which was like refreshing for the people that loved the, the older stuff. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing too. That's what we, that's, what I was looking to hear and there wasn't anything in new. Um, well, I mean, I, I have to take that back. There was, cause there were bands playing. There was this band Cornerstone, mm. um, yep. the, you know, that, you know, C Cornerstone Ignite was playing kind of a little style. They weren't a straight edge band though. So, mm. um, and they were in California. And I, I remember one of the things that really got us going was we, me and Anthony went to see Ignite at the Middle East and night there wasn't a very good turnout it was like i mean there were some people there but no one was seen that into it you know yeah. it was like man this is really depressing yeah. um and yeah you know corner there was a band cornerstone fast break i think actually started before us we just didn't really know about them i think four punch it, yeah i don't know it, yeah. they we you might have started like on the same day or like really close to the same time we just didn't know it so like it wasn't just us that there was other people with the same idea just had a slightly different take on it so like when we all started going it was like holy shit there's other bands doing this like so we kind of had like um you know there was floor punch in new jersey fast break in connecticut us in boston so the northeast really kind of started to like that whole thing kind of deform started yeah. to kind of form yeah it was it, now do you think that was a northeast thing because there was so many bands from up around here that were i mean you you mentioned fast break and then turning point was kind of like around that jersey time. yeah and um mouthpiece was like kind of around that yeah. time. um so th it was really like striving at that point well mouthpiece i mean like they were they were they kind of tried they well tried i mean they sort of bridged that gap between you know the late 80s and when we started you know yeah um and and then, you know there were some other bands too and then a lot of new age bands and I'm drawing blanks on the names at the moment but like 
you know, they kind of bridged that gap there. And then, but things also got real, you know, kind of metallic too. Like if you were talking about straight edge. So yeah, there was a lull for sure. I mean, and then as far as Boston in like specifically, there was definitely a lull for hardcore bands, at least the type that played this uh, hardcore bands that play the type of music that we were trying to play. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, when did you did you go to shows um, at the channel in Boston? Where like, being, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I saw uh, not that many. Uh, I couldn't really. I don't know when the channel closed, but like, you know, I was hit, I was catching rides with with people. I definitely saw Slop Shot. Mm. Uh, uh, what's uh, man? My brain is like fried. Sorry, I've had a long week. Oh, that's uh, all. Sam, uh, no, not Sam. Uh, Sam Black Church, Jesus. Yes. Uh, Sam Black Church, um, Eye for an Eye, like you know, bands from like the early '90s. Yeah. Um, you know, over the channel, and then they had a little. I said Shelter played. They had like a little club called the Edge that was like connected to yeah. the channel. Yeah. Back, yeah. Um, trying to think of what else. Uh, I, I remember going to like Fun Raddies, Paradise, see, you- like Vision over. Yeah, like I made it in like here and there, not a ton. Um, yeah. I definitely didn't get to see, like, so I just remember, like, I didn't get to see a lot of the bands that I really wanted to see, like, because I just wasn't into them until after they broke up. Like, I, I kind of just missed, like, Youth of Today and Gorilla Biscuits. I remember I was going to go see Gorilla Biscuits, and then they, like, I like I was all set, and they broke up, so the show wasn't going to happen. But I know, like, my friends were going to see them. But yeah. at that point, I was so into BMX and skating, it was like, they're going in the middle of summer on a Sunday afternoon to go in like a hot, sweaty room and watch this band. Like, I just want to go, like I wait all week to like, for the weekend or for like all, for, like, all year for summertime to just be outside and like doing yeah. stuff. So like, to me, it didn't make sense um, until later and then it was too late. So it was, you know, it was one of those, yeah. those things. That, that's basically kind of where I grew up in the channel. Um, the, the first show I ever saw, I was, uh, um, 11 years old, my, my cousin's buddy had his license and he was like, oh, do you want to go to a, a punk show? He said punk show at the time. Right. And uh, like I said, my mom was like, you know, a hippie and like, like yeah. I have the, the most structured family life. So um, I went with this kid and it ended up being SSD, DYS and the Angry Samoans at the channel. Wow. That, okay. that I ever saw. And I was hooked from then, but I was kind of scared because I had a little bit of longer hair and there was... Oh, yeah, yeah. A lot of people had short hair and I was like, thought I was going to get up. So I was scared a little bit. So I didn't start going to the channel. Like I took a lull because, you know. That's so, scary. Yeah. It like was. grown ass men with tattoos killing each other. I mean, yeah. being a kid and going down anywhere close to the stage, you just get kicked in the head with Doc Martens, like left and right. It's just like. Yeah. 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 I mean. No so joke. <laughs> I, I, I was I was scared, so I didn't end up really going to the channel until about eighty, maybe eighty six, eighty seven, and that's where I got to see. You know, I saw Agnostic Front. I saw. Uh, oh, you saw a lot of good stuff. Man. I saw Judge. Uh, I saw Slapshot a bunch of times because yeah. Fringe Productions doing all kinds of right. at that point. Um, and I also like you mentioned the Edge. I got to see uh, Killing Time and Eye for an Eye there and yeah. Ice. Iceman, I think, played back then, there at yeah. that time. So, uh, yeah, that's where I started really going to shows. And then Paradise, and then th- then I started going to The Rat and stuff like right. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, I it, I don't know if, if, if kids understand that, like, tattoos weren't normal back then. So, like, <laughs> you go in, I mean, I mean, I'm like a freshman in high school. Like, just, I just, you know, probably had a mullet, just looked like a dork. And yeah. there's like, I mean, grown like jacked. They they were probably only like eighteen or twenty or something. But yeah, like yeah. to me, they looked like forty year old men with shaved heads, jacked yeah. with like tattoos all over them, just like killing each other. I mean, you know, I that that was pretty intimidating. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. That's why I was kind of like, whoa, I, I like I'm gonna get beat up here, so maybe I'll. <laughs> I'll get a little older, although I, it was drawn to me, though. As soon as I saw that, I was drawn to hardcore after that. I mean, I like thrash metal, too, in between that, there, too. But then it became straight-up hardcore. It was like, 
that New York hardcore plus Slapshot and Sam Black Church because I always loved Slapshot. Um, I was a big negative FX fan too. So that yeah. just, you know, it, it goes hand in hand. If you like them, then you're going to like Slapshot, you know? Right, right, right. And Choke, Choke and Jet were always like fun to watch live anyways when you saw them play back then. Yeah, I, I remember. Uh, yeah, I don't know. The, the Choke would just like, I, someone told me at one point, I don't know if that's what you would say, but like we used to joke that like, because he'd always, he's always he's, he'd put the mic out and end up like smashing people in the face with it, and we were always like, I think it's because he because he, he wore glasses. He's like, well, he's not playing with his glasses. I don't think you can see. It's just smashing people in the face. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe he was pissed off. <laughs> yeah, that was. Uh, did you ever go to any of those POW? Um, uh, yeah, I remember I had like one of those. I remember getting like a shirt with had like a gun on it which that didn't age well it said like take no prisoners on it uh, i don't yeah yeah those are those are fun though that was definitely yeah good good times um i, I want to get back to kind of 10 yard fight talking about um when hardcore pride came out is that kind of where people started noticing you guys a lot and then you know i saw you guys play live after that came out and it was like tons of pileups and, and, you know, dog piles and stuff like that. Was that when 10 yard fight really got their groove going? Prob I probably, I mean, it was, we, we got kind of lucky in the beginning. We had some rough shows like in the beginning for sure, but we also had some really good ones. Like concerning we'd only played a few shows and we, like we, we put our demo out before we even played. I mean, honestly, we were on TV before we even really played a show or we were going to be on TV before we had that, that show at the red barn. Yeah. That, I'll tell the story real quick. Sweet Pete singing for in my eyes, Boston hardcore legend. Some knew someone who knew someone and they were doing a show about straight edge on this local talk show called Wraparound. That was on like the uh, local, like NBC uh, show. Yeah. And they needed, straight edge bands so sweet pete told them to call us and we had we had like a couple practices um i think we had our yeah we must have had our demo recorded and we went on and like it's around on youtube it's terrible it's embarrassing um but we were like man we got to play a show before we go on tv so mm -hmm. someone in like uh, uh piebald or cave and like hooked us up and got us on that show at the red barn so that's how we got on that show yeah so we played that and that went over way better than the show, the wraparound performance. Um, so, like when we played that first show, I just thought we were gonna get booed off out of the room. Like I, I went up there like, I was just, just like, thinking to myself like, this is gonna be fucking awesome and terrible at the same time because we're yeah. gonna stand up here and just play music these kids are gonna hate, and I don't give a fuck. Like, yeah. it, like it was just that. That was the attitude, and surprisingly, like. A lot of people seem to like it. I mean, we sold, we had, we had t-shirts, like who the hell has t-shirts in there for show? We did. Yeah. And I mean, we had like maybe 15 or something, maybe, maybe two dozen. I, we sold all of them, I think. Um, we probably sold all the demos we had, which I mean, not a lot, maybe like a couple dozen, but like for that type of show for us, it was like, yeah. oh my God, like this might actually be something like we just thought we were going to piss people off and be annoying. Like we were just going to be the, you know, the fly in the ointment type, yeah. type of thing. Like, um, and then I think our second show actual show was in Philadelphia, which is like, what the hell are you doing? Like, wow. you know, so we got like in my mom's car and put as much equipment in there as we could and borrowed equipment. I forget who we played with. I think Robbie Red Cheeks booked it. I could be, doing this i could have all these facts completely wrong yeah um but and that was like amazing like kids were really into it and i don't even know how like some of the kids knew the words somehow they had got a hold of a demo yeah like, what the hell like what's going on yeah um, and then we you know i think our third show someone threw us on a at the middle east upstairs with i don't remember who yeah it was a, it was a, it was a big band, and I, yeah, like I, in my mind, like it should, it should have been a really good show, but like, yeah, we did terribly. I can't remember who we were playing with, but like, I just I forgot the words. I couldn't talk between the songs. It was a nightmare. Um, 
And I think that's the show where we met Clevo, who ended up playing bass for us and being our roadie for a long time. Or at least where I met him, I think. Yeah. But it was hit or miss at the beginning. Um, we had a lot of really good shows, but some like rough ones. Like I didn't know how to sing. I was terrible. Like I could barely sing at practice. I didn't know how to talk in between songs. Like I would like turn my back to like I wanted to be Ray Capo and I was like Ray Capo and I was like, no, not even close, you know. Um, yeah, but, but you, then you say you say that though, but you, that demo sounds so like it gave me the feeling when I heard that demo. You say that like the singing was kind of like how you were having trouble, like you know your voice the way you wanted to do it, but. That demo, I was literally like, wow, this is some like old school New York straight edge or sounding. And, and the demo sounds still pretty decent, like recording wise. It's not like a whole. Well, Mick Turner knows the, he knew what he was doing back then. I mean, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like that was yeah. recorded very well. And yeah. the thing that you got was recorded at such a great level um, that your voice always came through, for me at least, uh, you know. Thank you. I mean, like, I like to say that was like talent or something. It was just like, I had no rhythm. Like the sound of my voice, I, we didn't even know until we got to the studio what it actually sounded like. Yeah. Um, luckily, it, it sounded good for what we were trying to do. Like, mm. I'm not going to say that I can sing because I can't. Uh, I think my voice sounds decent when I'm singing, or like yelling or screaming in a certain way. But yeah. I like the first few practices, like I could not get the words to pit of equality down with the music like i had no rhythm whatsoever yeah. it was like embarrassing so like to be honest with you i don't i'm surprised that the yeah i i almost didn't make it like like past the first couple months I, there was definitely probably talk of like hey like you know we like him but i don't think this is gonna work yeah. but then when we got in the studio and they actually heard what my voice sounded sounded like they were like okay like he's, they were really happy with how it sounded. And I yeah. was like, all right. Yeah. I, I mean, I liked it, but you know, it's your own voice. You never like the sound of your own voice. Yeah. So, um, and then, you know, Brian helped me a lot getting the, the pacing and the rhythm down. Um, so yeah, I mean, thanks, but you know, it was definitely not there from day one. That's for sure. Yeah. Now back then, did you like recording or playing live at that, at that? Uh, well, that was my first time recording. Um, I like playing live. It just like, I just didn't feel like I was very good at it. I honestly felt like, I think I was better at recording <laughs> than I was at playing live uh, once I kind of figured it out a little bit. Um, but I mean, I, I mean, I, I, even to this day, like I would do a band, even if we never played just cause I, I like making things. Yeah. So, I mean, it's what I, you know, whether it's a band or like videos or like, I don't know, whatever, like zines or like t-shirts. I've, I've always been trying to like, make things um you know whether or not anyone ever sees them or not so like i just like the process i guess of making stuff yeah um, now what was the first tour that 10 yard fight went on and did you go on tour with a with another band? was there like a sister band that you went out with? yeah i may be wrong but i want to say the first i don't know if it was a tour but it was like a long weekend with 454 big block um they're you know from boston we got yeah they just they basically said get in the van let's go and we i think we went down to virginia beach i remember we, we played with a band called blade crasher and i think i got that right and then i don't know who else we played with um it was just kind of a blur like we didn't really sleep i just remember like sitting in the back of a van with like i don't know 15 other guys and equipment and merch like barely enough room to sit with my head, like, you know, trying to stay awake, just passing out the whole time. Yeah. Um, I think that's the first weekend we had those, those, the, our, the t-shirt, like the Boston with the big Boston, like 10 year fight, like Boston straight edge on it. Yeah. Yeah. It just on the front. Nothing was on the back. Um, yeah. I, I mean, that was the first kind of like out of town thing we did. Yeah. I can't remember what else we did. I mean, I know, I think we did a week where we went down after Hardcore Pride came out. We did a week. We went down to Florida. I remember we like, so this was 96. It was right after the Olympics left Atlanta. Like they left, like literally, they cleared out like the day before. Yeah. And we had driven all night and we got out 
and we're like, holy shit, this is amazing. Cause all that stuff was still over. And it was like six o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And we hit, got on our skateboards and just started skating. Like all the like Olympic stuff that was like left around. Um, yeah, that was cool. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I don't know who we went with. I just remember halfway through um, Rama from big wheel called cause uh, he had put out our seven inch and it was yeah. new. Like I, I'm pretty sure it was, this was the first time we went on the road with hardcore pride seven inch. And I yeah. guess he was getting calls from a couple record labels and we're like, like what, you know? So yeah. Um, like I remember that sticking out and uh, yeah, I, I don't even know what the question was anymore. But. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was talking about tours and, and, and yeah. Yeah. Um, how did, how did a uh, Florida crowd, uh, how was that reception down there? Because I, I feel like Florida, I love Florida hardcore and stuff like that, but I, like you were saying, um, they're more metallic. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think this was that week where fear and weapons meet, uh, where fear and weapons meet, right? That's the, that was the name. Yeah. That was the big, I think that was the big band down there we played with, um, in Florida. We played at a house. Maybe this was Atlanta. There was a house that did a bunch of shows. I, the only thing I really remember about that whole time at that house was like everything. It was a hardcore house. Everything in the house had like uh, you know those little little label makers. Yeah. Everything in the house was labeled what it was like door, floor, <laughs> like like table, like everything, like absolutely everything. Someone went through and just labeled everything. It was ridiculous. Jesus. <laughs> it's kind of it was pretty funny. Now, after Hardcore Pride, um, Equal Vision obviously was interested in you guys. Um, how? Well, actually, was Back on Track or the Fast Break, uh, like Ten Yard Fight versus Fast Break? What happened first? Uh, so Hardcore Pride, I think the split was between Hardcore Pride and Back on Track. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was because some of those songs ended up getting re-recorded for Back on Track. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's how that worked. And how did Equal Vision get a, get a hold of you guys to kind of sign you to, you know, put a record out on that label? Um, I think he got a hold of Rama. Um, and then Steve Reddy came to see us play. Who, Steve Reddy from Equal Vision. Um, came to see us play, I don't know. I feel like we might have been in Albany. Maybe I'm getting things mixed up. He came to see us play somewhere. We talked to him. He seemed like the most straightforward and honest, reasonable guy. Like it was a little weird because um, Equal Vision at the time, like now we, you know, we remember they put out, you know, Bane and Four mm. Punch, and but they hadn't really put many like real hardcore records out in a while. Yeah. Um, you know, they put the Shelter stuff out, and then they were kind of like, you know, to be fair, there weren't a lot of hardcore bands hardcore band so it was, it was kind of like we weren't sure but he seemed like he really wanted to put out hardcore bands like yeah. more straightforward so like we're like yeah i mean he's cool let's do it so now did what, that's all i remember about it really didn't uh was one king down on equal vision yeah and i don't know i don't know if they were at that point or not i don't remember um they could have been I, I really don't know their history yeah um, but yeah, they, I mean, those dudes, some of them, I think, still work for Equal Vision. But like, I, yeah, um, they worked at Equal Vision. Yeah, we ended up going on a tour with them to Europe. Um, oh, okay. The, the, one King Down and uh, Hands Tied. Hands tied. Oh. Yeah, Hands Tied. Nice, nice. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, wow, that's awesome. Yeah. So, um, yeah, like, you know, so, so after us, they, you know, they, they signed Floor Punch, Hands Tied. I mean, One King Down may have been before us. I can't remember. Um, I don't know, Bane, obviously. Like, you know, so they, they built up more of a hardcore roster. Yeah, yeah. That the, Now, did did that make you feel better being on there since they were starting to, like, sign, you know, more hardcore bands after, after you guys had got on there? I mean, yeah, I guess so. Because it was easier to, like... You know, you know, I mean, when you know, if you if you pick up a record by a band that you've never heard or like you didn't know much about, I mean, back in the day, like you'd, you'd pick up a record and if, if it had that the Revelation star on it, you're like, you'd give it a shot. You know what I mean? Because you're like, you kind of already knew what it was going to be about, usually, not always. But um, so like, 
it's just branding, you know, mm. that type of thing. So like, yeah, it helps to have, you know, if someone picks up like a, um, I think about like even a shelter record, right? And they see Equal Vision on there, and then they see us. I mean, maybe you could tell the difference from the pictures or whatever. But like, if they're if they're if they love Shelter, and then they you know pick up Ten Yard Fight, expecting it to sound like Shelter, I think they're going to be disappointed. So like, it, it's it helps to have like similar sounding bands on the same label because it, it just builds that kind of thing, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, for such a uh, you guys were only together like four or five years, but for such a small time you put out such a great catalog. Um, obviously, the last thing was the only way EP on Equal Vision, but uh, what, what kind of ended 10 Yard Fight? Like, did you guys just, <laughs> life happened and, and like some people, you know, I hear all the time, like, you know, this guy was getting married or this guy was having a kid or he had a career move that he, right. that he just wanted to do. Um, you know, how yes. did end? The funny story is that kind of like surface straightforward story is that like we were supposed to go down to CBGB's and we we had uh we practiced in this like old mill building in Boston that had like the elevator was always broken and we hit, we were on the third floor and we were we were and it was hot no AC obviously it was like you know 100 degrees and we we're supposed to go down to CBGB's and we were all beat tired from working all week and we had a string of bad shows so we were like just like halfway down loading our equipment loading the equipment we started arguing and someone said fuck it i quit and then we looked at each other and we're like yeah let, forget it let's just break up and and like but that wasn't the that wasn't the real reason because like literally three hours later we all went to warp tour together and we're hanging out like yeah, yeah. It, was, it wasn't like we we didn't hate each other i don't really know i think i i so i know me and john lacroix wanted to move to california and like I was supposed to move before we started the band. I was going to go in like six months before yeah. we started the band. And then we started the band and I wanted to kind of like see that through. Yeah. Um, I was, everything else in my life was like kind of, to be honest with you, like other than the band. And I yeah. was just like, I need to get out of here and do something different. Um, it gets, I mean, in hindsight, it was only four years, but at the time it seemed like an eternity. Like, like it went fast. It was, a, it was a ton of fun, but like, Coming back from and trying to figure out how to pay rent, like anyone who's been on a band, like, at least back, I mean, back then, I think it was even probably harder mm -hmm. because you couldn't really make too much money playing. So you go out for a week, you come back, uh, hopefully your job was still waiting for you. You're like part time, like shitty job that barely paid your rent, you know, was there. A lot of times it wasn't. It just was getting hard. Like that type of thing gets hard. And it was like, we hit this point where we had it I mean, a couple times we had discussions like, okay, either we got to go full time because that whole job situation and trying to get by, we got to yeah. go full time. Maybe we don't need an apartment or maybe, you know, maybe we just like get some shitty little place where we live together and we just on the road all the time. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, or, or we got to like, just scale it way back and only play once in a while locally on the weekends. And like, that didn't seem like, I mean, that seemed kind of lame. So it was kind of like, we got to go full in or just call it. And yeah. we see, honestly, like at that point, it was like most bands, like if we looked back at the bands playing like this type of stuff that we were playing in that scene, it was like four years, five years, like pushing it. They all broke up. They yeah. like hit their peak and broke up. And we were like, well, that's kind of the blueprint. Maybe, like, honestly, we were at our peak. And it's like, maybe we should just call it. Like, who wants to, like, who wants to, like, hang around, like, you know, longer than we we'll want it, you know? Like, it's kind of, like, watch it slowly decline. Like, this seems to be the peak. Let's just call it. Yeah. Move on. Do something else. Um you know, and honestly, at that point, like, this may be an ego thing, but, like, in my mind, it's like, well, this is going well. Why couldn't I do this again? Yeah. Shit, <laughs> it's not that easy. Little did I know. But, um, I mean, that's, that, that's really the reason we broke up. Like, we didn't hate each other. We're all, we're all still friends. We're all still friends today. Yeah. There was no edge breaking at that point. It was like, yeah. you know, we were, we're all, all still, 
Well, hence, like, the, the This Is Hardcore Fest in 2018 you guys played. I mean, that must have been. Was that the first time you guys got back together again since? Or did as, what? Yeah, I mean, as, like, the, like a, the, a legitimate lineup. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, me and Clevo at one point, I forget what, I think it was 2008, played some shows. We didn't call it Tenor Fight. We called it First and Ten. And mm -hmm. it was, like, me and Clevo. My brother-in-law, um, and uh, like and some other dudes, like that were in his band, like just did kind of like a, like a cover thing and just played like a ten-yard fight set, and um, it I, and, and that was a ton of fun. But we were never gonna do a reunion. Like we didn't want to do it because, like, uh, I mean, me and Aaron Dahlbeck were the only, are the only ones still straight edge, so it was like, yeah. One of those things where I didn't want to do that, you know, for a long time. And then finally it was like, I just want to play with my friends, you know, like I just yeah. have fun. Like, you know, yeah, this is maybe call it what it is. It's a fucking costume party, like for to make believe, like this isn't really 10 yard fight, no matter it is, but it isn't, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, Cause honestly, I'm one of those guys who's like, I don't, buy it in any of the reunion shows like i i don't you know like youth today plays real biscuits plays like i like none of those reunion shows like you like them great i'm sure it's a good time like it's super hypocritical of me to sit here and be like you know fuck that shit but like that's how always how i felt because like in my mind it's like you know those guys are like like they're not straight edge anymore like i'm gonna go sing along to like or maybe some of them are but like you know so i didn't want to do that but we yeah. did it because like I guess I hit a point where it's like, I just realized like, I just, to me, it was more important to have fun. Like yeah. I'm going to be straight up about it. No one's, no one's pretending to be something we're not. Like I wanted to address it. Like, listen, I'm straight edge. These guys aren't, we're up here having fun. If you like it, cool. If you, if you don't think it's cool, I totally get it. Like just, if it's not for you, I get it. Cause I'm, I'm the same way, <laughs> you know? So it's, yeah, I don't know. For me, it was just a selfish thing, you know. Like, so after after, how was the experience? Did you did you what did you take from it after you played? Um, it was fun. I mean, I would have done it again. Like, who knows? We might do it again. Like, you know, you, like I don't. We haven't been asked. It, this is hardcore, but like, uh, like we had talked about doing some other shows here and there. But like, it just you know, it's a lot when we're all living like in different we were living like all over the country, different areas, just getting together to practice was like, yeah, cost a bit of money, you know? Um, yeah. So, you know, and we're not like a huge draw. It's not like we're, we're not Gorilla Biscuits or Judge, you know what I mean? Really? Like, we're one of those bands that can like get um, a big guarantee. You're like, it's not, I think we get something decent, but it's like, I don't know if the economics work out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, some of yeah. us have like, uh, I mean, we all have like real jobs and stuff. Like, it would, like honestly, it would probably cost. It sounds stupid, but like it would probably, we, like I think this is hardcore. We kind of broke even mm -hmm. as far as like taking time off and doing it, but it was well worth it. I think John would argue that he lost money, but <laughs> um, <laughs> like I used to, I used, to, I remember hearing like some of the bands like years ago playing these reunion shows and hearing the guarantees they were getting just thinking it was like i don't even i couldn't understand it until i got to the point where like like we got to the point where we had real jobs and careers and families and all the stuff that's like yeah it sounds like a lot of money but it's honestly like 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 i said it's in some cases some of these bands might be like losing money you know like yeah well um, like you said, if if somebody has to fly over and over again, to yeah, or drive x amount of miles to get there, or or you know what I mean, just like take time off from work. You're yeah. talking all this stuff, uh, in a way for you, your kids and your wife, and like there's so much involved when you get older and like into like I hate saying like real life, but it, you know what I mean, like like yeah. life stuff. You know? you know that being said, I'm sure there's bands that like that make out well on tour, you know, mm -hmm. and and like it's their thing it's their living they're doing it like full time and they're probably doing really well but if you're only doing it here and there it's you know and you don't have a huge draw to begin with it's hard 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Now, now talking about when tenure fight ended and then you moved to California, um, were you itching to get into a band? Is that kind of how Impact started? And then did you you switch the name to uh, Stand and Fight, right? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, was um, it itching for playing in a band? Is that kind of how it happened? I honestly, at first, I wanted nothing to do with being in a band. I wanted to do something totally different. Yeah. I didn't want anything to do with hardcore at that point. Um, just just wanted a break. Wanted to do something different. Like not like I like hated anything. Like I was still the same person but like i wanted to like i so i wanted to move to california because i had this dream of like being involved in like the bmx or skateboarding industry and um there's a whole nother tangent we could go down but like i i actually landed my dream job of i, I worked at four in one video magazine for a while there's a thing on the wall back there like they actually you know they they were doing skateboarding and i wanted to do like a bmx version of that and somehow i walked in off the street and and landed a gig doing that like it's a it's a longer story than that but like that's yeah. what i was doing um after a while i was like man, all i'm doing is working and i was sort of burning out and i was like i have i wanted to i missed going to shows and like i wanted to like meet people more in that world and it was like how do i do this and like to me it was like i well, i just i wanted to do another band i was like i wanted to do basically like if we could have done it like picked up with tenure fight again we might have at that point it wasn't realistic i mean me and john were in california people were all over the place yeah maybe one of like someone might not even been straight edge anymore at that point it, so it was like eh. and i know we talked to like i think carry on had broken up at that point and i remember talking to todd jones a little like he about me and him and Lacroix and like maybe doing something but nothing ever panned out Jeff Newman lived out there, who was an in my eyes. He was like staying with us, was, like, and he was he had played in Carry On for like here and there, some shows. That, like we all kind of we kept talking about doing stuff, but yeah. we never did it. So like eventually, I ended up. Um, I called Todd, but he was already like past it and doing something else. So he hooked me up with uh, uh, Kevin Chafee playing drums, and then Greg Bacon. Um, and we so we got together in practice and started doing the the impact thing. And um, the reason we changed the name was because there was a zine. I mean, now it seems silly. We should have kept it. But there was a dude doing a zine. Like we went on a East Coast tour, and there was a dude. I forget his name, but he was doing a, a zine called Impact. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't tell. I felt like he was like kind of like upset that we had the same name and i was like i don't want to, want to deal with this let's just yeah. like we hadn't really we hadn't put out anything other than the demo mm -hmm. was like we're just starting to build steam it's like if we're going to do anything about this let's just do it now yeah um and uh i don't know that's why we did it, i guess you know yeah now what what was actually put out by the you know stand and fight and impact what what was released was it was the seven inch and uh, um demo or what what was actually released music music yeah wise. so we did the demo which we the demo was uh impact demo that was yeah. 2002 we recorded that with nick jet in his garage he was just like i think he had recorded the terror demo like the week before yeah or something like that um and i mean i i listened to it. i think i think it still sounds good um and then we did a seven inch for bridge nine understand and fight. And then we re-released the demo understand and fight. So those two seven inches came out on bridge nine. And then uh, like the, 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 the second, the, the stand and fight seven inch was all new songs. So that was like 12 songs right there. Yeah. And I think a, I'm pretty sure bridge nine released a CD with both of those on it. Oh, nice. Um, and then, we did some like some comp songs. I can't remember exactly what. And then we did a. I don't think we did any split seven inches, but then we did a full length that came out on Bridge Nine. I think that was it. Um, pretty sure that was it. Yeah. Speaking of Bridge Nine, I um, I love that they re-released the Ten Yard Fight shirts, but like everything's sold out now. Is there any uh, chance that they're gonna re-release? Um, I, maybe. I, not that I know of, but who knows? I mean. 
Yeah. I mean, I mean, you never know. Yeah, I, um, I love the uh, the big TYF. I had like the, it was almost like a maroonish. Yeah, one. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I had that for the longest time. I wish that was like re-released because that was like one of my favorite shirts. And I also had the gray 10-yard fight that had the um, the football guy in the back. And then it just, yep. said, just said 10 It was like charcoal gray shirt. with. Yep. Uh, that Those are two of my favorites. I wish those were available. Not everyone in the band agrees about that. But, like, I, if it was up to me, I would make those available. Like, just maybe make them slightly differently. It's funny because I started um, – I used to silk screen in high school. And I hadn't done it. Like, during over the pandemic, I bought a bunch of stuff. And I started, like, messing around. And, yeah. like, I bootlegged some 10-year fight shirts. Like, I didn't – like, just for myself. Yeah. Because, like um, – but I would love to – really re-release a couple of those like definitely that boston shirt the hardcore pride shirt i don't know if evr still sells it or not but i never really liked the one that they did because it was a two-color design mm. and like i didn't really like the green shirt they like printed them on green like i didn't really like them like yeah um i always the original ones was a one color print it said you know hardcore pride in a box yeah whatever color on like athletic gray yeah. Or like white on and those those are actually the shirts we had at our first show. It was white on navy. Um and like I'd love to re release them like that. Yeah. You know, because why not? I mean I if I was a kid that was in a tenure fight, I would love to get one of those. Like Yeah, you know, yeah. Not- I I was like looking oh you know, years ago and uh like I said, I went on Bridge Nine, and I was like, "Oh my god!" At the time, I think they only had like youth small and 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 uh, yeah, really tiny. I mean, I'm a I'm a fat like fifty year old guy now, so I need extra large. So I was like, "Shit!" Like, yeah, I mean, maybe I'll bootleg something and, and oh, that would be you up. <laughs> like I said, I love the the TYF was like one of my favorite shirts of all time. That one, yeah, I think. Uh, thank you for saying that because I think that was what, like I think I would, had to push that one through because like. John LaCroix designed most of our stuff. And that one was like, that was, I was like, I want something that's like the SSD shirt. Yeah. Like that was the idea behind it. Like yeah. The letters didn't totally work the same way the SSD, but like in my mind, I'm like, it's got to look like the SSD hoodie or like, you know, yeah. like, um, but like, I remember like having some, there was some resistance to that. And I was yeah. like, no, we got to do it. Yeah. No, no, seriously. <laughs> I, I love that shirt. Um, talking about 411. Um, you had a hand in the, the CKY and the CKY2 right. uh, videos. Okay. I always like, my memory always is like the, uh, uh, what was his name? Mike Valley fight. That was yeah, in yeah. one of the videos, right? Where he fights the like four kids. Uh, it, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think that's in CKY2K. I should know because I, yeah, I mean, I didn't have like any hand in the content. It was just the, um, they, when they hired me at 4 and one it was to author DVDs. Because, like, it, DVDs were a new thing. They were going from VHS. They hadn't done any DVDs yet. That's actually how I got my foot in the door, because I knew how to do that from, like, the previous job. Um, so that's what I did, like, my first couple months working at 4 and one um, Back then, when you did it, authored a DVD, it was, like, you had to capture in real time from, like, a, like a tape. Yeah. into the computer and it didn't always work in fact 75 percent of the time probably it didn't work so i had to watch cky i must have watched it like 50 <laughs> times in yeah. like one week um and that was just to get it captured into the computer so once you got it there then you you, you know you set up you brought the menus in you did all the link the menus the, like buttons to like certain things or whatever yeah and then you have to burn a disc and then watch it, make sure that worked. And that was the same thing. It was like 75% of the time, you know, you'd get like halfway through it and there'd be some glitch. Yeah. And you start over. So like the first two things I did was CKY 2K and then uh, issue one of 401 Video Mags and the, the skate, the very first one. Yeah. So like I, bo- I watched both of those so many times and it's like, it was funny because I remember sitting there just laughing to myself and I'm like, I'm getting paid to watch skate videos. Like, it was like, this is the funniest thing ever. Like, like, I, I don't know. It was like, cause I, you know, I just remember like being younger and like my parents being like, where are you going to, you know, what are you going to, what are you going to do? Like sit around and watch skate videos for the rest of your life. I'm like, I don't know, maybe I will. Like, yeah. and then I'm getting paid to do it. So yeah. Like, that and out for sure. <laughs> 
I panned out for a little bit, but yeah. Now, um, that kind of put, uh, you know, a fire under your ass to start doing documentaries, because I know you did documentaries with Anne McFarlane from uh, Polyglot and Blood for Blood. Um, did that kind of, you know, light the fire to start doing documentaries, just because, like, not that, you know, the full yeah. one documentary, but it's kind of in the same type of vein. Type well, they, of yeah, I mean, they had some articles, like Day in the Life articles, and, like, they had, like, that was the most kind of documentary style thing they had. So mm. they'd follow a guy around for a day um, yeah. and just document his day, you know, like, you know, what, what he would do for a day. So it was kind of like a, like a, you know, documentary, like, you know, magazine type thing. So like, yeah. um, w before I left 411, like a few months beforehand, like I had this idea to start like a hardcore video magazine, basically take that, um, there was, there was, they also did a thing called on video magazine, which is more like, um, historical, like yeah. you know, stuff like there was, it, it was a mix. It would, it would, they would cover like an old skate video. It would be like a 10 minute part. just like an old skate video. Yeah. And then they'd have something newer. There was like a, they did a thing like MTV did that Cribs thing. They oh yeah. Did like they like a, like a rip off of that. Like it was called Cribs, but it was just like, it was like Rob Diedrich's Cribs yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Like, so like, they did that, and I was like, I want to do something like that, like a hardcore version of it. So I did this thing, like under pressure video magazine. And it was, it was, it took a few years to. It didn't come out for like three or four years after I started it, really. Yeah. So I did a thing, and it had like uh, Project X was in it, uh, Jamie Sharapa from SSD and Slapshot, like had had a little piece in it. Uh, what was it? Oh, Betrayed. There was a little like doc on on Betrayed. So that was the uh, the first one. I that that was the first thing I did like that. But yeah. in the process of making that, between the time I started that and and the time it came out, like a couple of years later, um, I had moved. I moved back to Bo to Boston, yeah. and hooked up with Ian McFarlane, and we started doing like music videos, and um, we got hooked up with the Dropkick Murphys to like do some. They did a uh, this. I don't know if you remember back in like 2004. They did the song Tessie. Yeah, like around like the Red Sox like breaking the curse and yep. winning the world, world Series, and they did a music video for it. And the guy, whoever edited it, they weren't happy with it, so they actually had me re-edit it. And that that's on there. There's like a single somewhere that has that on there. Yeah, um, like a CD single, like enhanced. And um, we did some stuff for Slapshot. I mean, Ian had a lot of hookups with, with different people. Yeah, and um, we started doing that stuff. And oh, through doing the Tessie thing. We got hooked up with, <laughs> it's funny, like, I don't know, do you remember the hip-hop group Third Base? Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Now, was now was it Prime Minister Pete Nice? That, yeah. That kind of, there was like a little, he set you guys. He, yeah, so, I mean, I could go on for, I, that was a weird situation. But, like, we hooked up with him, which was bizarre. Yeah. Because um, I just, like, we, we were talking to him for, like, I didn't know who he, like, he was Prime Minister Prime Minister Pete Nice. I just he's Pete Nash, this old like baseball baseball historian dude who wasn't yeah. really old, but like you know he's a couple of years older than me. And at that point, yeah. anyone older than me was old. So like, um, you know, like, like we hooked up with him, and I just think he's just like this nerdy baseball guy. And he started asking me and Ian about like music and like our bands. And then he's like, Yeah, I used to be in this band. And then he was like, Yeah, I was, and we're like, and I was just kind of blowing him off. Like, yeah, yeah. whatever. Like, I didn't want to get into it with them because, like, people yeah. who don't know, it's like. Yeah, it's hard to explain and not. Yeah. You don't want to waste your breath. Yeah. And, and then he's just like saying, he was like, it was a hip hop group. And I'm just looking, I stopped for a second. And I'm looking at him like, he looked nothing like he did, like you would remember him looking like yeah. in third base. And I'm looking at him and I'm like kind of squinting. I'm like, I'm like taking some years and some couple pounds off them and trying to I'm like dude are you fucking prime minister pete knight from third <laughs> and he's like yeah, yeah i'm like what <laughs> and um you know so he's he was like the baseball historian dude had like um all these artifacts he had like the i don't know how much of this was true now because like yeah. he ended up getting some hot water for like a bit like fraud and stuff with some of this yeah. stuff but like Supposedly had like had brought all the stuff to where we were working in Ian's house, like the first the ball that was thrown out opening day in 1918 at 
uh, Fenway Park, like opening day. Really? Um, like, you know, like all this crazy stuff. And we're like, this is crazy. So like we hooked up with him and he like produced a, um, a documentary or like co-produced with us about like the first original like baseball fans and really like, uh, like sports fans as we know them. I yeah. guess. Um, and then me and Ian did a Slapshot documentary, which took forever to finish and come out. Uh, and then after that, like, we kind of wanted to do different things, so we went different directions. Um, he obviously has done a, he's done a ton of stuff. He did that AF documentary, which is amazing. Yeah, so good. So, um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of... No, no the Slapshot documentary... Where like where can you see that? Where can you find it? Good Why question. It? Like uh, it... you could try asking Tang about it, but I don't think you'll get very far. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, I'm like I'm not gonna lie about it. I'm bitter about that thing because we filmed it. It was done in I think it was done in 2008. I mean, it took us a while to finish it, but we finished it in 2008. We it premiered at a bunch of film festivals. Mm. Hang was supposed to release it. Uh, he didn't release it to, to, until 2012. So, I mean, we put years of our lives into that thing. Yeah. And, I mean, we didn't even break even. Like, like I don't even want to get into the, the financials of documentaries. They're not good. Like, yeah. You you lose money. We didn't. I've never made a, a dime on any thing. <laughs> I've done like a project like that. Um, so, you know, he releases it four years later. Forget about money or anything. Like, we just want people to see it. Yeah. Um, between 2008 and 2012, also, everything went from SD to HD. So this thing comes out in SD, and it's like, it just looks old. Like, it was old. It looked old at that point, you know? And, you know, Slapshot had been still on band for another four years. It's like, <laughs> I... It, you know, so I don't know where you can see it. I know we've tr we've thinking about trying to get it up on iTunes, but like, I mean, if you talk to anyone who's ever dealt with Curtis, it's not easy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like, yeah, I've only seen like you know three minute clips on YouTube or, yeah. or like that. And, I, and I'm such a big Slapshot fan. Um, I was dying to find it. I yeah. I mean, it's it's a travesty that it's not on like, you know, like an Amazon Prime where they have all those documentaries or Tubi or something like that. Yeah. Where you, where you can watch it. I mean, it. he could probably see Amazon. Amazon Prime has gotten weird. I released the some stuff recently. And um, as I was releasing it, they kind of stopped taking all like independent docs and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I had my stuff up on Tubi, my Don't Stand in Line docuseries was up on Tubi for a while. Yeah. It kind of got lost in the mix. I actually ended up t taking it down. I think I'm going to probably end up, you can still, like, you can buy it and download yeah. it, like, like video, like, on demand. Yeah. Um, at some point, I'm just going to put it up on YouTube so people can see it. Yeah. Um, again, it's one of those things where, like, I you know, I made my money. I didn't make my money back. I made enough to, like, cover, like, any travel costs I had. But like, yeah. you never make money on those things. I put so much time into it. Um, it's just something that you know I love doing. Like I'm, I'm still working on a second season of the docu series. Yeah, got three quarters of it filmed. I'm trying to figure out how to film a, a fourth person. It's just nothing lines up. Um, yeah. So I don't even know what I was talking about anymore. But like, yeah, the, the, I mean, the documentaries are cool. It's just like it's more of a passion thing than anything. Um, yeah. Now, how long is that Slapshot documentary? I think it's 90 minutes. I haven't, I believe it's 90 minutes. Um, yeah, I wish I could point you to a place to watch it. Um, I might have a link somewhere I could send you. <laughs> yeah, because I like, think so you can see it. Um, is it that Tang owns that and they won't like, you know what I mean? Yeah. You you can't take it and put it on on a streaming site. Is that basically they, they uh, have not that I'm aware of? I'd have to go back because I know me and Ian were talking about things recently, but I'm pretty sure Tang still owns the rights <coughs> to it. Uh, we started it independently, and mm -hmm. then like a year or two into it, we were like, we were broke, 
and like yeah. we were talking to Tang about it, and he offered us basically enough money for us to kind of keep going. Yeah. Um, and so we, we basically sold it to him, but I don't think it was indefinitely. I don't know. Like we, we part own it with the band too. Like, honestly, I don't know at this point who owns what I'd have to really, we'd have to, we'd have to look into it. But um, if it was up to me, I would just take it and throw it up everywhere. Just yeah. watch it, you know? Well, that's what um, I mean. People haven't seen it. And right. I, 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 just, I know I hear, I hear that every once in a while. They're like, well, how can you see it? Where's, like, I mean, I wish whatever, like, I don't know that anyone's ever made any money off it. Maybe Curtis made a little, I don't, I, I don't know. But like, I, you would think he would repress it if it's sold out, like yeah. make it available, but. Yeah. Um, so you um, can't buy the DVD now, right? The, the, the Tang's not even selling that? I don't think so. Like, I don't know for sure. I haven't checked in a while. I, we don't ever hear from him. So yeah. um, you can look on his website. I'm also, I don't know. Like I heard people order it and just didn't get it though. So like, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's almost like a crap. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, 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 that's one of those things that like I, you know, I, I wish I had a good answer for you. I just don't. Um, yeah, especially because you're behind, you're behind it. You and Ian are behind. Yeah, it. I mean, it's our, it's our names on it, you know, and yeah. it's slap, you know, between us and Slapshot. I mean, I'm sure they get fucking questions about it all the time. Yeah, like they're probably you know sick to death about hearing about it. Yeah. Um, now, is, is that similar to the the Sam Black Black Church documentary? Did Tang put that out too? Because like I, there's no maybe. Way to watch. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know anything about that one either. Um, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't know. Hopefully, either we can get control of it back, or the band can, or someone can. Uh, maybe Trust Records can get it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it'd be nice if someone could get some get a hold of it and do something with it, like just so people can see it. Now, what what about the what about the Red Sox documentary? Is that is that uh, available to watch? Um, that's another one. It's the same situation. Like, I know the distributor had it out all over the place, and it was selling for a long time. You could probably find that on eBay, like a disc. Yeah. Um, I've seen it in the past. Pretty that one, pretty cheap. Um, I don't know anywhere where you can like officially buy it now. It's not available for streaming or anything. That's a weird one because um, initially, like, I don't even know if I should be saying this, but like there was some like a lot of like rights with like uh, Major League Baseball that never really got taken care of because our producers kind of sketchy and uh, you know I don't know he, he I know he had some like legal issues and. Yeah. with the government and all kinds of stuff. I haven't heard. I don't know. Um, yeah, it's one of those things where, like, by the, honestly, by the time both of the things were done, I was just like, I'm out of here. Like, yeah, because yeah. it was, it started off as, like, a labor of love. And by the time you got done with it, like, four years, both of them took, like, I don't know, two or three years at least. Yeah. And then it didn't come out for a couple of years. And, like, by the time it was all said and done, it was like, just get me the fuck out of here. Like, you know. Yeah. Um, which is too bad. <laughs> but but it did put a bad taste in your mouth because don't stand in line. Like that happened, and and um, you're working. You you uh, I I heard you on a podcast say that you might have something big for a documentary that might happen too. Is that still in works or like? Um, I know about it, but maybe, but I don't know. That's one of those maybe. I mean, I would say there's like a 10% chance of that thing happening now. Um, I don't know. It, it depends. Um, so, yeah, I mean, don't stand in line to, just to, to go back to what you said. Like, it, like those I finished in 2008. Don't stand in line didn't come out until 2020. So, mm -hmm. like, there was a good – and I, I started on it in 2019. Um, so there was, like, you know, there's 11 years of me just – fuck it, I got to figure out how to earn a living yeah. type stuff where, I mean, I still do, like, I do, like, every type of video production possible other than porn, basically. I, um, you know, weddings, corporate, broadcast, commercials, like, I, I've done, like, everything. Like, I just started a new gig for a TV show, which is, like, it's cool. Um, so that, you know, like, that 11-year period was me trying to figure out how to make a living. Mm -hmm. 
before that it was like i love doing this stuff i just want to make films i'm going to be a filmmaker and like i realized that like yeah that's awesome but somehow you got to pay the mortgage so um don't stand in line with me like just saying i don't need to make money on this now i'm just going to take whatever free time i have and make something that i like that's cool with friends you know have a good time just make a project a cool project with cool people and is if i can make the money that I put into it, if I could get that back out of it, I will be thrilled. And I, I did manage to do that. Yeah. Um, that's about, I mean, I managed to get enough to get me as far along into like a second season as I am. Like I'm three quarters of the way through it. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, I, which was, was, was great. You know, um, I loved doing it. I had a great time. I want to like, like I want to put the second season out as soon as I can yeah it's you know like i said i just started a new job like ba basically like it's funny i put out don't stand in line and then i went out and got a job but like yeah you know i i've been doing my own business for like 11 years and great but i haven't stopped doing doing my business i'm still kind of doing that on the side but like i i was at this point where i was i was a little burnt on the business part of it and it's like i just wanted to do, spend more time like shooting and editing and i was like if something cool comes up and it sounds like a good fit, I'm going to give it a shot just because yeah. like, why not? I can always go back to the other thing. Yeah. Um, and so like, that's what I've been doing. So um, don't stand lines a little bit back burnered, but like, Oh, like it will happen. Like, like the, the new one, it's just, it's, it's been difficult to line up that like finish shooting. You know, I, yeah. I did, three quarters of it last year. And I've been trying to line up the, the fourth person like ever since. And I don't want to just, I want it. Uh, I, I don't want to rush it. So like, yeah, you want to do it. Right. Right. Like, right. Um, if it gets down to it and I can't and like, like it could just be done with three people and it would probably still be pretty cool. Um, but I would, I'm still trying to do, to, to do the fourth person. Yeah. Um, now if it doesn't work out with that person that, that you, you know, it's kind of on a standstill right now. Is there, is there multiple people that you have like in the back? I of mean, life? yeah, there's a lot of people. Um, obviously like you like COVID complicated things tremendously. Like yeah. the first season was all filmed before that. The second season was filmed like right when everything opened up in like last year. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was like, things opened up. I was like, fuck it. And I just went out and like banged out as much as I could. Yeah. And then, I got like all my um, bunch of like paid stuff came in that wasn't there for like, you know, I, I was like, I got to take this so I can get it. Yeah. Um, and then I had a bunch of like health issues, like my feet are complete. Like, like <laughs> I went from like not being on my feet to being on my feet, like 12 hours a day for like three months straight. And then like, I like, I fucked up my feet real bad. So like, yeah, I had this period where it was like, I couldn't like physically do it, do do anything. Yeah. Um, and now, like other people are busy. So it's like just trying to line things up. There's a lot of people that I, I, will, I think would be great. It's just trying to figure it out and like, right, how do you travel and line this up? And now I got to figure out like, I got to actually clear, like this is new for me now, like to clear, like taking time off with an employer. It's like, yeah, I haven't done that in like 12 years. It's like it's yeah. a little weird, um, but they're cool. I mean, I, like it, like I'm sure I'll be able to do it. It's just, um, a little bit on hold at the moment. Yeah. And on top of that, you have the podcast too as well. Right? The podcast is, I don't, you know, that's, that's, I had lined up a bunch of people and like for one, like partly my fault and partly other things happen. And like, it never, uh, like, like for us, for like a season two, Yeah, I guess I should say, like I lined up like four or five people and like, like most of it was my fault. And then a couple other things happened and like, it just never happened. And then mm -hmm. again, like everything, like a bunch of stuff happened at once and I haven't been able to reschedule things. So I think that will happen when I get closer to having a, a season two of the docu-series because it's, it's, it's just it should definitely kind of go together. I feel like at this point. Um, yeah. Things have been just crazy, you know, yeah. a lot of things have gotten like, like crazy in my, in my life well, it, last like few months like work-wise personal wise like there's a lot of crazy stuff going on so yeah 
Um, yeah, yeah, I totally understand. <laughs> it seems like you have a lot of irons in the fire, which is a good thing. You know what I mean? Um, is there anything in, in your holster that you're holding on to that you want to do creatively that you have in the future that you want to work on? Is there anything oh, in Oh, my God, yeah. I mean, there's a ton of things. Um, I had a list of things. Don't Stand in Line was, like, just one thing on, like, a long list of ideas that I've been putting together for, like, the last 12 years. It's almost yeah. like... Uh, when we recorded our the 10 year fight demo, like I had all this like anger and ideas built up for like, I don't know, whatever, 21 years of like being an angsty straight edge kid. Yeah. And uh, so everything went into that demo. So like, you know, don't stand in line with like all these ideas materializing, you know, like in that project, but I definitely still have a ton of ideas. It's just finding the time and the resources to make things happen. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it may or may not happen, you know, yeah. some of them. I mean, I definitely had ideas even just for like, you know, doing stuff like counter ten fight wise. It's like, yeah, I think I could put, you know, I could possibly put together that original, like our last show video, like mm. one of the tapes is lost, I think, but I think I have like 75% of it. I've been, I messed around with some of the footage. Like I could put this out and like actually put it out in color and HD and make it look cool. As yeah. opposed to just that old black, like when I put that together, it was it's black and white because I had no idea how to match like four different like home video cameras that were just yeah. set to auto and pointed <laughs> at the stage. Yeah, um, the audio sounded great because we had you know uh, uh, Dean from Four Fifty Four Big Block and Matt Henderson from Madball, like fucking recording engineer, like yeah. professional dudes recorded. Um, but video wise, it was like edited anything before really before i did that yeah uh, so i'd like to redo that um uh, you know different ideas like yeah in the vein I, of I, don't stand in line type, type yeah. things i always like i know there's been boston uh hardcore documentaries i mean the the one that everybody's seen is kind of the old school type you know ssd the beginnings of of it yeah um, i always wanted to see like a you know like like I guess like ninety to ninety, like yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, midnight, like three to you know two thousand, whatever. You know what I mean? That yeah. like be real interesting to me and and see some footage. I know it's tough because a lot of people have footage and they just lose it and they never put it out. You know what I mean? Which is yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, I you know, I, that's definitely an idea that I kick around in my head. It's like, um, I mean, that could be look if someone goes ahead and does as well, then fine, take it and run with it. Cause I don't know if I would ever have time to do it, but like, yeah, you could do a docuseries with seasons. You could, your first season could be like early 80s, like just on Boston hardcore, like yeah. you do early eighties. You could do, uh, you could do 80 to 85, you do 85 to 90, you could do yeah. 90 to 95. And then, you know what I mean? You could break it up or break it up four year, period, whatever, break yeah. it up. Cause there's definitely those different phases. Like after us, you got a whole American nightmare. Like, you know, whole conspiracy, like that, that wave. And then whatever his, there's, there's all, you know, you, yeah. that could go on for a while, um, but you could at least do through the early 2000s, I, I would think. And then maybe it gets a little bit just, I think after like fucking internet ruined everything, like everything sort of became one thing, every style at the same time. And like, I don't know if those genre waves still happen, yeah, but it just seems like every it's all fair game now, and it has been for a while. Like I don't know how much things change, other than I don't know, not like it used to, anyways. Yeah, yeah. Now, did you ever want to? You know, we were talking about metallic, like straight edge hardcore. Did Did you ever want to get into that genre of like straight edge, like you know the the Earth Crisis or the the Morning Again, which was kind of like a more metallic, like yeah. Straight culture was kind of a little more metallic um did was that anything was that alluring to you or did you just want it straight up like old school like yeah i mean nothing against those bands it wasn't i listen to earth crisis every once in a while like but it's more like it's not something I, it's not my thing it's it doesn't do it's like you know um so like if it's you know, the reason we started Turn Your Fight is because that's what I wanted to hear. So, like, yeah. to me, like, I'm only, I like, I create things I want to, like, you know, the docuseries, I wanted to see that. If someone had made that, I would have watched it. 
So, yeah. you know, that I would probably only be in a band that I would want to listen to. And again, nothing against those bands, but it's not the stuff that I would seek out to listen to. Um, yeah. And there's, I don't think there's a shortage of it either. Either That's the other thing. Um, <laughs> when we started 10 year fight, it was definitely like a, a drought with, for those type of bands. Um, which is why like, you know, like would I start a band like that now? Probably like, like 10 year fight. I don't know. Probably not. Um, I don't think I'd start a band at all now, but like, yeah, you know, if I was going to start something, whether it's a band or a video or like a, whatever I'm going to create, it's going to be something that I'm looking to consume myself. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I just wanted to, because like, like we're talking about straight edge being such a, uh, you know, it was a boom all of a sudden, you know, obviously the New York stuff and, and SSD, you know, that was big. And then there was a lull and then 10 yard fight came in and the bands you were talking about, like fast break and turning point and, and, and bands like that. Um, but I was just wondering about the metallic hardcore side of things for, for, for you, because it's not for everybody. Yeah. Uh, I mean, again, you know, nothing against it. Just not my thing. Um, it is Martin K. He said, hi, he said hi to him. Um, yeah. If it, I, you know, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm starting to lose my train of thought here, but it's cool. I, it's funny. Cause I, I like, I remember considering starting a metal band with like some other friends of mine at one point, just like as a joke, it's like, I could probably pull that off. Um, <laughs> and who knows, like, I don't know, maybe I could, maybe I couldn't, but like that, that would be one of those things where like with my luck, we, we would pull it off. It would be good. And then I would just be like, miserable because i'm like ah we have to do this because people like it but it's i don't like this music like yeah. one of those like yeah, stupid like deals or maybe it would just be terrible that that could very well be the case too but. <laughs> <laughs> well i don't want to keep you for too long so you got the end of the box um i usually do a rapid fire um okay so ready for some rapid fire I, I i will try it's been a long week and i'm an old man but i'll give it my best shot all right my first question always is all-time favorite New England punk hardcore band for you, all time? Slapshot. Not just because Mark McKay is watching, but definitely Slapshot. Um, my second question, what was the first punk hardcore show you attended? Like a real punk hardcore show. A real one? Yeah, not like a Battle of the Bands type thing, like, yeah. like a hardcore show. What was your first one? I think I, and this is like, again, this is like, I was late to the game. I think I saw Vision at Bunratty's. Mm. Like, my first, like, real, like, like, going outside of, like, I mean, there was hardcore bands that played at the Red Barn, like, mixed in with some of those, like, weird, like, high school, like, cover bands. But yeah. it wasn't, like, a hardcore show. Like, my first, like, hardcore show, was that was probably it. I don't even know what year. It was, like, Vision, a band called Crawl Pappies. Oh, Crawl Pappies. <laughs> you need to, uh, <laughs> And I think it was at Bun Ratties, and I was probably scared out of my mind, uh, but trying to pretend that I wasn't. Yeah, I mean that was that was probably it. Nice, like nice. ninety one maybe. Like I was I was pretty late. Yeah, yeah. All things considered, I liked Vision, and Vision was a good band back then. Yeah, they were. Yeah, they were good. Definitely. Uh, my next question: uh, What was your all time favorite show that you played? Could be a, a couple. What was like your all time favorite that kind of meant something? To you? Yeah. Um, okay. So the first time we played in California at the Pickle Patch, uh, which was Steve Aoki's house, <laughs> we used to do hardcore shows there. Uh, yeah. That was amazing because we had no idea what to expect. It was like uh, you know just a living room at this house in, I don't remember where, in California, Santa Barbara. Um, you know, kids were jumping off the stairs, like diving, like, and like, we just got an insane reaction. And it was like, we had no idea what's, we, what's what to expect. And it was like way better than we could have expected. And then yeah. the next night we played in Corona at the Showcase Theater and that was crazy too. Um, those two shows for sure are favorites. We, uh, Bochum, Germany was amazing. Um, actually, at first, was it a first? I don't know. There, there was a bunch of shows in Europe that were good. Um, our last show was insane. Like, I couldn't even, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe 
the people that came out for that, like people yeah. came from Europe, like that was that was just a whole weird experience. I mean, w especially with the Red Sox playing the Yankees across the street. Yeah, from where we were, the whole thing was just nuts. Um, I mean, those were the standouts, I guess. I mean, a first show, obviously, but like, yeah, that you know, I don't know. I guess those are the those, nice. those are them. Nice, nice. Um, my next question is. What was your all-time favorite hardcore show that you attended that you didn't play? Like, that yeah, you I, went to uh, My all-time favorite. I don't know, man. Um, that you kind of like, you, you know, it was like. I once saw, I mean, I once, we once drove to New Jersey and saw Sick of It All play in a basement. That was pretty cool. Wow. That was like. Four, three. I don't know. Um, I mean, let's see. That would probably be it. Like, yeah. That that would probably be the. I mean, like I remember seeing Slapshot at the channel with one of those POW shows, and that was yeah. awesome. Um, that one sticks out. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I, I'm I'm sure I'm missing I'm missing some some good ones. For sure. Yeah, I know it's tough. When, like, I, like I always talk about age and stuff like that, but memories blur. Sometimes I don't even remember shows I went to. Like, people will be like, "Oh, remember we went to the yeah. show?" And I don't even remember that show at all. And they're like, "Oh yeah, like the uh, pictures and stuff." And I'm like, "What? Like, I can't even." I don't know. Age is a is a weird thing. That's for sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, there was definitely some. Uh, there was some good band shows for sure. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. Like, <laughs> one of the best ten yard fight shows I, I I can remember was the the when you guys played with Dead Guy and Bloodlet at the the Rat. Okay, the Rat and was the, always good. Yeah, yeah, that was like really really good show. You guys played. Was that the show that someone got like hit in the head with a fan, uh, like a a box fan? Like, I needed... think. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think four fifty four big oh. block. Show too, and and still suit from Long Island played that. Was that show. the same show? I think so. I think it yeah, was. I think that was probably that show. Yeah. Yeah. Um, rat rat was always a, a a crazy time. That's a share when you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll keep going. I'm a big movie guy. I don't know if you are, but I always ask this question: What was the last movie you watched? Jesus, the last movie I watched. Well, I want. I'm, I've been trying to get out and see Thor. Um, I'm big. I like the Marvel movies. Yeah. The last movie I watched may have been a kids movie. Um, I watch more TV than anything these days. I'm yeah. trying to get through Dexter. Just I don't know. Just got through St Stranger Things. I don't know. <laughs> last actual movie. I I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I'll yeah I'll, like a lot of the time, it's it, my answer would be because I have, uh, I have a oh. 10, 12 year old. So I know exactly what it was, and it wasn't even a movie I liked. It was Spider Man Two with Tobey Maguire. I do not like this Tobey Maguire Spider Man. Yeah. But my kids wanted they they've been bit, they like wanted to see him because we showed them, we showed them all the 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 Tom Holland ones and the um, yeah. what's his name? Uh, what was the other Andrew, Gar Andrew Garfield ones. And I, I, Tom Holland, definitely the best. I like the Andrew Garfield ones a lot. I hated Tobey Maguire. And they're like, we want to see him. So um, I sat through the first two, and then they watched the third one without me. I was like, I guess. Yeah, yeah, the third one is by far the worst one. Yeah, yeah like, I mean, pe people love him. They say he's the best Spider-Man. Like, all right. Um, but, like, to me, I when those movies came out, I didn't like them. I was, like, really disappointed. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I always ask that, and I always ask this too. What is your favorite horror movie of all time? Favorite horror? I'm really not a horror movie guy. Um, what was my favorite horror movie? Like, I don't know if I have one. Um, I'm trying to think. I like. I don't even like. Honestly, like I. I took me three tries to get through The Shining. I mm. kept falling asleep. <laughs> And, like, that's a classic, like, film, horror movie. Like, people, like, swear by that. And I had a hard time with it. Um, 
You know, like a lot of the classic ones I didn't even see till recently because my wife maybe watched them because I'm just not a horror movie guy. Yeah. I, I, like one of the first ones I saw that I remember when I really, when I saw it as a kid, it scared the shit out of me. It was Poltergeist. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I can't. I'm not a big horror movie guy. Yeah. yeah when I, when I saw Poltergeist, that scene where the kid gets pulled under the bed. By oh, my him. God. The clown? Fucking hate yeah. clowns now ever since I saw that. <laughs> yeah. As um, soon as I heard, heard the, like, the foot drop on the floor and the kid like looks over and looks under his bed like I was yep. yeah that I was I mean I was so you're two years old I don't know I think I was like must have been like seven does that sound right maybe were you like nine or ten when you saw yeah. it yeah something like that yeah. yeah I was like why are my parents why did they let me watch this <laughs> <laughs> um I I also am a, a big hip-hop guy like mostly okay. nine 90s hip hop, boom bap, eight, like late 80s, 90s style. Um, and I always ask, if you've been listening to hip hop lately, what have you been listening to? Lately, fuck, uh, I can't look it up. Uh, there's a, there's this hip hop group, and it's I came in that I really like. It sounds like old school Beastie Boys. It's like this dude's name. I saw something on Instagram, and then I went and downloaded the stuff. Fuck, I can't remember what it's called. It's like, it, it just like, it is like, doesn't even like really have a name. I can't go and look because I'll lose you. Yeah. Um, I re listen to it all the time too. I just have yeah. a playlist. Send, only, send, like, when this ends, just send me a link because I'd like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It's, this. uh, sounds like Beastie Boys. Like, if you like Beastie Boys, you'll like it. Yeah. Um, it's weird because his older stuff was like, not rap it was like um it was like just a, like a house dj or something like yeah, yeah. Not even, i don't even it was like just like electronic remix stuff yeah um i wish i could remember his name mm. yeah you'll have to you'll have to like uh when when you get off and you find him just just tell me the name and i'll look it up i know like i can't yeah i can't remember his name but everything was like featuring bray b-r-a-e that helps mm. anyone out there yeah huh. no kid nice nice um and i i got two more questions what was your favorite song to play live uh 10 yard fight or a couple what were your favorite songs to play live man uh definitely holding on was fun the only way was fun i mean they were all they were all pretty much fun but um proud to be straight oh great song Amazing. oh first and ten so i that